There's a vast amount of racism in American film, but this might be one of the most racist films we've done. No, the religion is actually just manipulating people and leading people into unjust wars for no good reason other than keep the rich rich. Whoa, man, mind blown. But you're not thinking like a capitalist there. I'm not. That's that's always been my problem. It's a nice liberal nationalist movie where the president can go can go blow up aliens with a jet fighter and yet you're still not actually being xenophobic. It's kind of amazing. The whole QAnon universe, I was like, this seems right for them to grab onto one of these two movies and totally miss the point. Yes. And they have. You know, the best they really have is like gentrification and real estate speculation in hospitals. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's Cleveland in a nutshell right there. Fuck capitalism. Fuck all of this stuff. It is a movie that should be watched by organizers and radicals and leftists and anybody who wants to make a better world. This movie, on the other hand, uh, means none of those things. <laughs> it's a, a Franken blockbuster, like you said, and it's put together in sequences that play out like movie trailers. Really regressive gender politics, like mm -hmm. incredible, but to the point of near parody. No, Norm, uh, George White in this movie definitely would have been wearing a MAGA hat if this movie was made uh, nowadays. Oh, God, right? And then convince the workers to break their own picket. Yeah. Fuck this movie. It's, um... <laughs> Damn, I wish this movie was better, because that's a <laughs> kick-ass ending. This, this is a paint-by-numbers propaganda movie that completely works because the characters are compelling and real. Welcome one, welcome all to the politics of cinema. On this show, we believe that films are never neutral. There's a political as well as artistic message captured in every film, in every country, in every time period, and we're on the lookout for all of it. My name is Aaron Spears. And I'm Isaac Miller. And on this episode, we're looking at Kathleen Collins' Losing Ground from 1982. Kathleen Collins, who both wrote, directed, and edited this film. Isaac, before we start, I got to give you one of these... I had never heard of this movie before. I'd never heard of Kathleen Collins before. I thought I was a great film history student and uh, someone who dives in and explores. But I now have, uh, you know, a new auteur that I am unfortunately not able to study a ton because she was she was she was taken tragically early in her 40s um, without putting out a lot of films. And also, unfortunately, she was born in a time period where, as we mentioned on the previous episode, there was a Hollywood conspiracy to keep black artists from practicing their craft and getting it out to the public. See our discussion of Killer of Sheep. Uh, Losing Ground is another one of those. Bless the Little Hearts, Ganja and Hess. The list goes on and on. I mean, you know, that conspiracy called systemic white supremacy. Yeah. Not one of those like made up bullshit conspiracies, like a legit one. We were like, oh, God. So you're not like, well, we mentioned, with you know, Killer of Sheep. You're not making a black exploitation film. Well, nobody's putting this movie out. You're not making... You know, uh, you know, Richard Pryor comedy in the 80s, Kathleen Count. Sorry, you're not getting this out. Oh, you have uh, a very interesting and authentic portrayal of the black. Exp oh, no, no, we're not interested in that. We need novelty. And uh, we, you know, us white Hollywood, we know it's going to play to a black audience and a white audience. So no funding for you. Exactly. Ugh. And obviously, you know, even more so, let's say, for a, a female director. Oh, 100 percent. But this is. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, this is just one of those movies where I can't remember. It's when it was put on Criterion or something, and I probably read about it somewhere. And it was like, I'm going to put this on my list. And um, it's been on the list for a while. And then I was like, you know what? It's time to watch this movie. Let's do this. And let's do it. I'll, let's do it for the podcast. Yeah. Um, so again, like we mentioned with Killer Sheep, that one, well, listen to the previous episode, we went into detail on that one. But this one, again, it's, you know, it's, it's credited as 1982. When can a general audience finally get to see it if they were paying attention to DVD and home video releases? 2015. What the fuck? Yes. But at the same time, you know, quality shout out to Milestone Films, who put out both this movie and Killer of Sheep and Bless Their Little Hearts. And they have a great selection up on their website. So go... Uh, Go support a quality label. It's doing great restoration of like completely forgotten masterpieces of film history. Of well, of of of, of black American cinema. Well, specifically I mean, that for what we're talking about right now. But they have a bunch of other, you know, they also have, they have the connection, the Shirley Clark movies up there. Someday we'll do it. <laughs> I think you've been talking about that movie for like two years. Well, I've been talking about the Cool World and the connection, but yeah. Oh, um, that's fair enough. Yeah, early Shirley Clark. Separate, separate. Uh. Coming soon to your ears uh, via the pod, via the politics of cinema. But today it's uh, the Kathleen Collins show. Yep. 
So let's uh, let's introduce this movie. What is it about? Uh, where does it come from? And who's in it? So I, I I was trying to grab as as we normally do like a quick synopsis, you know, IMDb or Letterbox, whatever. And um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read you what I grabbed, and then I, I have a question for you. <laughs> A comedy drama about a black American female philosophy professor and her insensitive, philandering, and flamboyant artist husband who are having a marital crisis. When the wife goes off on an almost unbelievable journey to find, quote, ecstasy, her husband is forced to see her in a different light. Is that, okay, first of all, is that is that the way you would describe this movie? Kind of. I mean, he's forced to see her in a different light and doesn't really handle it very well. No, uh, I mean it's it's it, part of it is is spoilers. He doesn't, yeah, he does not actually pull this together, and and he's forced to see it in a different light. But part of it is, it, yeah, I guess that's sort of what's going on. But the thing is, it's it's so layered for each of yeah. the characters in the film that a description like that doesn't get anywhere close to capturing it. Well, so then I switched over to, let, to uh, sorry, that was Letterbox. I switched over to IMDb. And it's still listed as comedy drama, but it says she finally she gets a name. Our main character here, Sarah, a cold college professor and her husband, an ecstatic painter, spend a summer away from the city straining their rocky relationship. I guess that's sort of closer, though. It's like very literalistic. So part of it is she's doing research on the concept of ecstasy as a philosopher. The the, the ecstatic experience. The ecstatic experience, but that is her reflecting on the box that she's put it been put into, the sort of role that she plays, and the, yeah. the sort of space that, in a certain sense, she sees her husband be able to sort of play around in, and she not, and it, you know, both her, both her husband and her, and her mother, in some ways, put her it put her into where she doesn't feel like she has the space to reach out, right? And you know, it's it's a box that she put herself into too, but you know, so it's. To a certain degree, probably through her life. I mean, it's 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 complicated. So yes, I mean, and she directly refers to his ecstatic, his capacity for ecstasy, but it's a little too on the nose. It's a little too yeah, <laughs> a little, yes. little bit. Yeah, she's also like kind of cold. I don't think she's like super cold. I think no, because I mean, like, you're aware of what her passions are. It's just not. Like physical passions. It's more it's like not, her, her her passionate intellectual pursuits. She, I think the better word is reserved. And I think cold sure. actually is a sexist connotation, frankly. Um, yeah. So part of it is, is, is somebody else might call her cold, but she's she's reserved and unable to find expression in stuff. And, and part of it is, this isn't said within the film, but so here she is. She's seems like a tenured academic. Highly respected by her students who mainly have crushes on her, I think both male and female, frankly. And I think that's why – you're right. And I think that's why Cold did register to me because she is playing a quote-unquote like stereotypical like academic or being a librarian. I recognize some certain stereotypes. She has her hair up. She has glasses on. Like she's playing that like you know academic or librarian kind of vibe. But because like you said, her students clearly have crushes on her. All of them. Yeah. All of them have crushes on her except for the guy who's listening to music while she's talking. Bad form. But yeah. the thing is that, like, that, that's not something – she laughs at them partially because, I mean, you know, that's not something that she's going to act upon, obviously, which, I mean, one that's incredibly inappropriate. But in the early 80s, that would have been more common um, or less completely – I mean, now it would be – well, we have a lot of controversies in academia over this stuff and cases and there's uh, – you know, it's it's wrong. But I never felt the film was going to go into that territory. It, it doesn't. She doesn't even think about it for a second. Right. That's not – she doesn't – she doesn't view them – they they push her because they're treating her in a way that other people don't. Right. So part of it is, yes, her husband knows that she's a beautiful woman. He does – you know, they have sex. Like they do – you know, he, he, he paints her. But like he also has put her in this box. And her mother has as well. Mm -hmm. And – her students are the ones who sort of don't treat her that way. I mean, part of her history, which is not stated at all, there's only one reference to other academics that I can think of. And it is her wanting to cut loose on, 
you know, cut loose in a way that's that her husband, um, who's played by Bill Gunn, Victor, um, basically um says is not her. She wants to cut loose on these who are almost undoubtedly white men, right? At this point in academia, it's disproportionately white men today in 1980 or 1982, it's vastly more so even probably. So, you know, she wants to cut loose on these pompous men. Um, but that's like the only hint of that. But you can't imagine that part of the level of rigor and decorum that she has is because she's a black woman in that space. It just isn't really talked about as much. I mean, it might be in some of the patter, but not very much. That's a really good point, because one thing I, I wrote in my notes watching this, especially the, the the first few scenes here where you see her in her professional academic environment. And also, before I mention that, the, the detail that, that Kathleen Collins, who, who uh, wrote the screenplay, as we mentioned earlier, and comes from a, a very philosophical and academic and theater and very artistic background, she she wrote this screenplay where it's starting off in a philosophy class. Like that's the opening scene. And it's not just like the way like I would right now, like Google a couple of philosophy quotes or whatever, you know, it's like, Oh, then Nietzsche said, blah, you know, like I rewound it. Cause I was like, wait, 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 like this is an actual like classroom lecture discussion. Right. Like it felt, it felt very real. I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm back in a college class right now. It didn't feel like a scene in a movie that was like trying to capture. Like it was, it was a very, uh, like unabashed philosophical discussion kicking off the film uh, that I thought was like, oh, uh, this, this is great. Well, like you've been pointing out, actually, like the word you've been using since we watched Plan B, Isaac, like the texture to it, like it just feels like you're dropped right into an actual college classroom. So I, I was glad the film wasn't pandering or taking sort of like dialogue shortcuts because I could imagine this scene, this opening scene could be very, um, could be off-putting to some viewers because they're like, oh, it just jumps right in. It doesn't have anything to do necessarily with the plot of the movie, but like it just, it's so authentic. Um, I really enjoyed that. But then she gets sort of like student after student. And I think some colleagues um, mention these comments about how happy her husband must be with her. Yeah. Which I thought was really, really fascinating. It wasn't just like, wow, you're an amazing person. It's like, oh, man, your husband must really be happy with you. Or it was like, wait, 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 what? Yes. I mean, and she sort of muses over this, right? Both because her marriage isn't that great, frankly. And also because it's a very, it's reflective of sort of a patriarchal attitude, but it's also like a very weird thing to say. I mean, the one part of it is though, each of these students, there's a, there's a ritual that comes through where she sort of stares them down and laughs them off. Right. So the one guy, frankly, the first guy who brings up her husband basically wants an affair, right? Yeah. He's like, I'm not going to be, or he's like, he's graduating or he's almost done at school. And then, Hey, He's got his class with her next next semester, but like, yeah. And she's just sort of like, yep, my husband, and just shuts him down. And he sort of looks off forlornly. I can't remember if the female student who's like, oh, almost, and she's meeting, they they meet in her uh, in her office, right? Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's it's a fine line. Um, I don't know if it was just like admiration or if there was some flirtation going on, but it was clearly like she's an adored teacher, right? And then. And then so- yeah, and then finally, there's our um, budding uh, young black filmmaker who wants her to be in the film, who obviously has a crush on her as well, but wants he plays that out through. I want you to be in my film, which initially she regret. Initially, she's laughing, and it's sort of he's charmed, and then she keeps laughing, and he just sort of walks off with his glance of disappointment. Which eventually, spoiler, but like she does take part in the film, and we, we should get to to how that happens. Well, before we get there. I fell in love with this movie in this particular scene because this budding filmmaker references, he says, oh, you could be another Dorothy Dandridge um, at one point. But then he also references this like wildly obscure movie called Scar of Shame. And I got really excited about that one because the one of the things that was something I was doing at my, my, my job at the library where do, I was doing these blog posts for kind of like the history of, of the black experience on film for black history month. And I was like, well, we can, there's, there's some gems we can, we can um, go back to in the early days. Like instead of complaining about how like, Oh, the twenties and thirties and forties was so racist. Like, yeah, that's true. But there was also these other things. If you dig a little deeper that were going on. And in 1929, the scar of shame came out, which was a silent film. But this film was produced entirely by the Colored Players Film Corporation, which obviously that's a dated term. 
but it was a one of one of a number of production houses. I think like Million Dollar Productions was another one. These are all black films. They were all black casts playing like every single role in the movie. Um, for the most part, from what I can what I can read, it's it's predominantly uh, black crews, but not entirely. But very very interracial production team going on. But in front of the camera, these these would have this the the, the on the poster would say like featuring all black class cast or uh, uh, the colored players uh, presents or whatever. Or featuring a cast of, of of colored actors. So, in this particular movie, though, the Scar of Shame, of all the movies that she could have picked to to reference, if you're going to go back to these, uh, they were called like race films back in the day. Um, Oscar Micheaux is probably the most famous director that that did a lot of these, The Girl from Chicago, that sort of thing. But the Scar of Shame, in particular, is about an educated, affluent young black musician who marries a woman from a lower socioeconomic class to get her out of the clutches of her abusive uh, stepfather, beats her, abuses her. Um, horrible situation but once they're married the the husband won't let his new wife meet his mother because he knows his mother uh because he's very affluent and you know everything else his mother will be disappointed that he married uh quote below his station is is the title card they use in the movie so not even just referencing this you know one obscure movie from 1929 in the silent era but specifically a film that does have an all-black cast but also is about class in general right which is kind of fascinating. So, I mean, when we sort of make this connection, I mean, last time we dealt with film by a black film filmmaker dealing with working class and poor black people in LA as regular people, right? Right. As as subjects as are of 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 sophisticated cinema dealing with life and all of its complexity. The Italian New Realist did. Right. This is a movie which does that but with I mean, I guess, you know, you, I would call them professional class in a certain sense, but like you could, you could say upper middle class, right? She seems to be a tenured professor. Mm-hmm. He is an artist who has just sold his first painting to a museum. So he's officially yeah. a success. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so part of it is this is dealing with a different class in which, you know, they can rent a mansion for the summer. Right, right. That's their that's their their celebration plans because of his now like I'm an established museum artist, right? Which want to get into like you know how those are sort of how we first start to see the tensions, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, you know, so part of it this is you know this is a movie this is a movie about a part of, the, of basically a part of the black population that doesn't get movies about them made, and you know, certainly not. Um, you know, serious artistic movies. Um, So that, you know, it's very, it is very intentional and it's, you know, it's partially, a lot of it is set in, in specifically in an art world and some of it in academia. I don't know. It's, you know, that in itself makes it special. Obviously the fact that it's really, really, really good. (laughs) That, that that helps. (laughs) Yes. So uh, I think as we're doing that kind of brief kind of class comparison with, with Killer of Sheep, I think one of the th- one of the things that really stuck out to me is the the portrayal is very like it's ordinary people living their lives. Right. It's not a superhero story. It's not an action film. Um, it's not a supernatural movie. It's not you know like it's not a genre picture. It's just here's here's some ordinary people living their lives. But also, it's not oh the race of these characters is front and center. This is part of the plot. It's well. It's part of the tapestry of their lives. It's always present, but it's not as a plot device. It's not. Um, it's not you know, a plot device. Overcome this like racist. You know, like, like you said, yeah. It's it's there and it's the tapestry. It's the texture to it, but it's not like the central preoccupation of the plot mechanics of the movie. I mean, it might even be. It's deeply central because it's central to their lives, but it is not a movie made by white liberals. Right. Right. Which I thought was really really fascinating and uh, very refreshing as well. Um, but then I ran across, uh, just doing some research for this. Oh, it was when I found, uh, that, uh, milestone films, as I referenced earlier, it had restored and put this movie out in this 1982 movie put out in 2015. So I found uh milestone. They, on their Vimeo channel, they posted a full, uh, here's the title of it is Kathleen Collins masterclass comma 1984. It's like an hour and 50 minutes. And she's at, uh, Howard university, talking to um film students and and the guy that does the intro for this this video mentions like he's there she's there talking to film students and she he, they want to address 
how these students can make, you know, low to no budget films, but maintain an artistic uh, vision, et cetera, et cetera. That's the topic of, of, of her talk to them. And then it goes into a Q and a afterwards, which were fantastic Q and a, I'd highly recommend watching the whole thing, but her intro then Kathleen Collins intro for how to like how she maintains artistic vision by operating in kind of like lower micro budget films is not about the practicalities of like equipment or, or, you know, how you can deal with, um, you know, getting permits or not getting permits, just, you know, shoot a gorilla style or anything. She first wants to talk about what she calls the Christian metaphysic and how that shapes her entire approach to her art. Like she's like, you know, before you even write your screenplay, you have to understand this one thing about the world. That Christianity is based on the concept of salvation, that therefore there must be in life a moment of revelation in which one is transformed from a sinner into a saint. If, if, if this dichotomy or this, or this split, which is what I want you to think of, if this split is made in the psyche, not only individually, but collectively, you have to have in any society sinners and saints. Because the Christian metaphysic has required it. It is an obligation. Now, Obviously, if you take this context and you apply it, which he does, not only to homosexuals, he applies it to blacks, he applies it to women, what you come away with is the recognition that in American society, we have been defined as the sinners. In other words, some, some particle of the society has to take the blame for the sins of that society, the evil impulses of that society. Because you're working out of a dichotomy now. You're not working out of a Buddhist tradition in which oneness is declared potentially possible for every human being. You're working out of a Christian metaphysic that says one is first one thing and by an act of transformation, one becomes something else. All right? It's the essential split in the psyche. Positing that split in the psyche, transfer it to the society. And what you get is projected sinfulness on somebody. Now, we were the most convenient scapegoats. It's a, it's, it's, it's a game or it's a projection that has gone on now for several centuries. It is important to understand one's, not only one's position in the society, but the emotional role that you play in the society. And the role is more important than the position because the role defines not only your behavior, but the necessity of the insider to have you there as an outsider so that the notion of sin can be projected outside of him and onto somebody else. So what I think is really fascinating and the way she words it there about like the emotional role that you have to play in society um, as being almost more important than your position in society, that I, something about the way she was describing that really cracked open losing ground to me because she's saying how um, – you know, if, if African Americans, if Black people are the perpetual outsiders and the scapegoats within society, you never get to be the insider and just lead an ordinary life. At least, uh, you know, within the art. So that's exactly what she's doing here. Um, right. Which even she says later on about how like it's no accident that white people do not like seeing Black people lead ordinary lives. She was saying that specifically in real life, but I think that's completely represented um, in this film. And also, she's not necessarily connected with it directly, but like a lot of the LA Rebellion stuff we were talking about with Killer Sheep last time too. Well, and you, so you think about it. So this is this is a movie that stars uh, Bill Gunn. Uh, we 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 mentioned this last episode. Uh, we we are Bill Gunn completists around here. Bill Gunn uh, uh, was was a writer writer director, most famous for directing uh, Ganjan Hess. But he also well, and he mainly in, uh, he wrote what novels and yeah. playwright. Um, but if you look at you know. Um, he, you know, basically right around the same time, right before puts out 
a movie. Well, a movie, I mean, it's actually sort of an episodic um, soap opera uh, written by Ishmael Reed uh, called Personal Problems. And it's very much, I mean, it's very much sort of like people lower down on the class, you know, black people lower down the class scale than this movie, but sort of like nurses and maybe office workers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it's basically, a, you know, it's like a, a sophisticated interpersonal soap opera like shot on tape. So the quality doesn't hold very well, but it was 1980. And also, yeah, if you're, I would imagine if you're, if you're working without um, large financial support, it's economic to shoot that way. Yes. I mean, that's, that's what's going on. And part of what strikes me, it's, it's another similarity where there's this very intentional sort of like soap opera esque, but you know, very grounded soap opera esque. I don't mean that in sort of like a heightened sense. But it's sort of like the travails of normal life kind of thing, but like mm-hmm. with with drama. And so there's there's a certain I mean, it's these are very different movies. Obviously, her style is very different. Her subject is different. But you can see that thought at play that this very intentional sort of, you know, approach um, to, to, to the sort of stories that you want to tell. Right, right. So like we so we get this opening scene was sort of introducing her students and her life as an academic. And then we meet her husband played by Bill Gunn, Victor, who is a painter. Um, this is hot Bill Gunn. I mean, I think I forgot it's been a while since I've seen Ganja and Hess, but like dude is like in shape. And whereas in Ganja and Hess, he's not playing somebody who's, I, if I remember correctly, it's been a while. He's not playing somebody who's sort of like there to like have sex appeal in this. He's playing a guy who's hot and middle-aged and in, and, and in a, um, let's just say he's, he's, he's in a midlife crisis and he needs to show it. Right. (laughs) Yeah. You know, he's a, he's a museum level artist now. Right. You know, there, there's a little swagger that can come with that, especially the way Bill Gunn plays it. Um, also exhibit a, if anybody uh, is near internet movie database right now, just look at his profile picture. You'll see on IMDb where he's naked. Yeah. But basically, I mean, he's – what he's looking for is a place for them to stay for the summer. He wants to get out of the city for the summer into a different town, more scenic, but also happens to be full of, in his words, basically Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican women who he can draw and potentially uh, screw around with. Um. And her reaction to this basically is, you know, is there a library nearby where I can do my work? Because she's working on she's working on the subject of 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 ecstasy in her in her philosophical in her philosophical writings. Yeah, her her ecstatic experience. Well, part of it is is that she doesn't have one, so she's looking for one. She looks at her husband who does have one through art, right. and so she's this bottled up person. So she's trying to write about this. And in a certain sense, he's blocking her from that because he wants to go to this place and he doesn't really, it's where you see the first tensions in the relationship because he doesn't really care, right? Like he doesn't care that this is totally disruptive to her. No, not at all. In fact, it's like, I want to go, like he's in love with, I want to go here. I've seen all these like, you know, wonderfully attractive Puerto Rican women that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to paint or do whatever, who knows. And then when she specifically asks him like, well, is there a library there? He's like, well, there's a library, but there's no Kant or Hegel there. I was like, well, yeah. then, you know, she's not going to be happy. Right. Yeah. He's, he's there. And part of it is both he and then the other relationship that we see, it, 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 you know, her mother are pretty dismissive of her work. Yeah. But do you think that's like they don't quite understand it or is it more just like, oh, it's your your teaching thing or. I mean, I think it's that they don't get it and they view it as just sort of like, you know, dalliances or, or, you know, they don't they don't take it very seriously. Right. Like it's all this mumbo jumbo that you do over there or it's sort of I mean, it's 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 you being in your head and that's what you've always been. Mm hmm. And, you know, part of it is, I'm trying to remember within the sequence of the film, but also she meets, you know, right around this point at, 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 a, at a library, she meets Duke. Right, right. Who is a becaped Dwayne Jones. Dwayne Jones, one of the most important actors, frankly, in American cinema, because he plays the lead in Night of the Living Dead. He's also the lead in Bill Gunn's Ganja and Hess. Yeah, 
and and he's he's someone who can go to toe to toe with her philo- philosophically because he went to seminary, which is where you learn a lot of the same things. And also in the most like cutesy, flirtative way possible. Right. He comes in. They they can flirt through philosophy. And it's 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 yeah. like a yes, yeah, she can retreat, not retreat, but she can head to what she knows, which is academia, which is books, which is studying for the ecstatic experience. But then he comes in, and within moments, you're like, okay, yeah, here's your ecstatic experience, ma'am. Yes. I mean, or. Here, yeah, here's your way out of this, right? Right. So, you know, they go to the city. They have some good moments, right? You can see them when when he's drawing a painting of of her, of you making a patron, portrait of her. They're sort of jousting and their underlying tensions are present in the jousting, but it's still friendly. Which I really love because it's it's one of those, like, it's not this or that. Like, it's not a completely loveless this is clearly going to fall apart. Mare is, it's just like, you know, they've been around each other for a while. There's like, it's kind of like a little bit of like a malaise has just set in because they've been with each other long enough and that can happen. And she's going her route. He's going his route, right. but it's not, it's not like all unhappy and it's not all amazing. Right. And he's clearly chasing that, you know, ecstatic experience all the time, whereas she's not as actively pursuing that. Um, as he is, but yeah, it's not just all one thing. Like you have, like you said, even in the beginning setup in that opening bit where they're, you know, in their, their professional daily routines where she's teaching and he's painting, um, you know, there's a little tete a tete every now and then, but also like, you know, they're, they're still like having sex and going to dinner and he's painting her. And, and I, I, you know, I think the underlying, the underlying problem here, along with sort of her needs to express herself in different ways is that ultimately he's pretty selfish and yes. is not able to, and we're going to just see this thread throughout the film until it becomes unbearable. But he, he both, he wants his cake and he wants to eat it too. And he doesn't want to give any ground or pay enough attention to how she's actually feeling. So part of it is what you end up with is a very nuanced. Yeah. I think you're right. A very nuanced portrayal of a kind of dysfunctional marriage but where you don't need to have explosive fighting to show that until you do. Right. So as he starts to sort of spread his wings and specifically picks a very attractive, probably half his age, at least at least Puerto Rican woman to, for him to sort of like paint a portrait of, (laughs) Um, but he doesn't like cheat right away. That's the thing, right? He doesn't just jump right in. Oh, he enjoys the whole process. You can tell, but The other thing is, as you watch him, and this is going to play out later in the film, is this person is a toy for him. Oh, yeah. This is something where he wants to be able to control it completely. And part of it is, despite all the things that he doesn't give his wife, he doesn't have complete control over her. Right. He wants – I mean this is where the midlife crisis comes in. Even though he's finding his ultimate success, he's hitting those limits. And this is sort of said in the movie. He's hitting in his mind some limits, and he wants that completeness. Mm -hmm. Um. So she decides to actually um, take up her student's offer and take part in the shooting of his film about 1920s vaudeville actors and uh, Tragic Mulatto, which does parallel her own life to, to a certain degree. I mean, it, more directly as the movie goes on. Well, it's a, it's a, what is it? It's a old like folk ballad, Frankie and Johnny. So it's, yeah. it's a woman who kills her husband after discovering he's having an affair. I wonder if that's going to play into the the real life situation here. Nope, not nope. at all. <laughs> but it's also it gives her an outlet because like she hasn't, um, she's never acted before, and you know she's right. kind of not like wooed, but she's intrigued by this film student because she even mentions uh, eventually in the movie that like she's heard from her colleagues like, oh no, he's supposed to be like this brilliant student, and you can tell like he's he's really into it. like he's very passionate about filmmaking. Right, it's very kind of you know avant garde sort of thing, but. It's a time when, okay, so like I referenced earlier, she's she looks at the beginning of the movie like your traditional academic or librarian or whatever, hair is up, she's got, you know, glasses on, you know, a lot of sweaters, you know, closed neck, like all that stuff. But then now when she's, um, when she's playing the, the, the part of Frankie in this, this avant-garde film, you, you start to see her lose herself into like the art here and, and move towards, you know, moments of transcendence, but at least like maybe a little closer to that ecstatic experience. Um, she's been researching, but now she's like feeling. And to a certain degree on un- unleashed sexuality, which is oh, helped yeah. by the fact that her co-lead in this film is 
her student's uncle, who turns out to be Duke, who she'd already met. Which, in but when you said it just now, I was like, oh, of course it was in my head. But I was like, I didn't feel that way watching it. Like, nope. when it happened, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, cool, good. Well, first of all, I was like, so, great, Dwayne Jones is back into doing more stuff. But I was like, oh, okay, sweet. Well, let's take a moment just to talk about the craft of this movie. Because, first off, you're right. It's structured so well, and we're so in it that, like, we don't groan with this, right? Right. It works just fine. It feels very organic as the story is moving along. Could you say something about how this movie shot? There are so many damn good shots in this movie. Yeah, it's so – I think once you get into the part where the student film is being made, it 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 kind of gave me – Sorry, I'm pausing because I'm trying to I'm, I'm totally spacing on the Godard movie about contempt. Like you get a different visual language because sometimes we're seen from inside the student's camera, like as they're composing shots. And then sometimes you see them or no, I'm sorry. You almost all see, you, all the shots that the student is directing. You see from the camera that the student is using and then he'll yell cut or he'll he'll talk to the actors about doing something differently. And you'll see sort of like that in the, the, the kind of quote unquote behind the scenes image of it, too. But the camera itself is really fascinating because that opening bit where they're both in their normal day to day lives, it's very like just static shots. And in fact, actually, there's a couple shots where she's in her office talking to students where they're talking directly to the camera, which is always very striking to me. Um, you don't see a lot of filmmakers doing that. Mm-hmm. And once they're off at the summer home area for, for the month, you know, getting away, the, you know, the camera moves around a little bit more and it, it gets a little bit more, I don't know. It just feels a little bit more relaxed. Yeah. It kind of wanders a little bit. I mean, not wanders is not the right term, but like, it doesn't feel as like tightly rigid and composed as it does when they're, you know, in, in their, um, like the first, maybe like fourth of the movie. Well, like there's the scene, there's a scene where they're having a tension filled dinner after he sort of gets his new muse where it, the camera just goes back and forth to each as the tension rises. Oh, and then, yeah, yeah. And then as it stops, it just stops in the middle of the table so you can't see either of them. I forgot about that one. Yeah. So good. Uh, there's this scene um, later on in the movie. There's going to be an extremely awkward party where, like, she sort of even gets cut off. So it focuses on him in particular ways. And then there's my favorite thing. So part of it is she eventually basically you would just say like, she basically says, I'm going to be on this film shoot for five days. And, and Victor Bill Gunn is very angry with this. Right. So how dare I'm sort of goofing around and doing my thing. How dare she do the same? Right. He can't stand it. He can't stand in his midlife crisis, whatever dudeness to deal with this. But so basically <laughs> there's this scene. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. Just thinking about it where basically uh, the, the the young filmmaker drops on 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 Duke and 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 Sarah last minute that they're going to have to kiss in the scene, and so it's like hyper focused on them, and then you see the filmmaker like way off in the distance, right? And he says this, and it's like sorry to drop this on you, and they start kissing because they've been wanting to kiss the whole damn movie. Oh right? yeah yeah yeah. They start like really making out and he just sort of standing in the background. You can't possibly see his expression. And I just laughed out loud. It is yeah. really, really funny. He's just standing there. He's like, it's, oh, it's so good. It's so well composed. And the, the comic timing of it is perfect. And like the tension that's been building is perfect. It's so good. Yeah. Cause like we know what's been going into their relationship so far, um, you know, Sarah and, and uh, Sarah and Duke, but the fact that um and he and he approaches it you know the right way he's like oh i am sorry to drop the sign but like you know it's there's like you're not dropping anything that's just giving us an excuse we're good so you know part of it is so should we talk about how this culminates basically well it culminates with the party you were talking about there where when the the, the film is wrapped up duke comes back with sarah to the house where now you have uh bill gunn and and the woman he's having an uh, affair with all together, but also he has a, a fellow artist, Carlos. Carlos. So part of it is, is this whole time Victor is trying to wrestle with, he feels like he's been following Carlos his whole, you know, his whole career. Like Carlos has been a mentor to him in a certain sense. Yeah. In, you know, in between the balance between abstraction and not abstraction, they do different types of art and Carlos doesn't need models and Victor does need models. And all of his sort of like, 
crisis of confidence as an artist is sort of centered on this, even mm-hmm. though they're, they're very good friends and he views him as sort of a mentor figure, but now I'm going to leave that behind. The problem is that as soon as Carlos shows up, you know, he's sort of, it's not clear that he's actually slept with this woman and it doesn't seem like he's had. He attempts to kiss her. They dance some. He's very possessive, but there's no one else there to compete with. As soon as Carlos shows up, who's also another middle-aged man who's older than him. Uh, and, you know, this woman is probably in her early 20s at best. They start speaking in Spanish. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And have way more to talk about, right? Yep. Way more in common, way more to talk about, you know, and whatever. And part of it is, I mean, he's he views her sort of as an exotic object. Oh, for sure. Um, the Puerto Ricanness of it and all that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the way that, you know, race is sort of deployed in in the language that they use, the sheer formality of how they talk about it within the married couple when they're fighting. I mean, there's a lot of layers to this that one, I admit that I probably am not picking up on and some that I don't feel totally confident in digging at when I think I might be. But basically he starts getting jealous of that. And then she shows up with this handsome, tall actor. So another artist really. Right, right. And he starts getting jealous, but that means there's enough people for two couples on the dance floor and he's not in one of them. He gets drunk and he gets pissy and oh, starts yeah. yelling at everybody. And part of it is, and this is where he's, he starts grabbing Celia, who's we haven't actually named her, but the the, the his 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 muse, quote unquote. Oh right, um, right. He starts pulling her away from Carlos, and everyone's like, "What are you doing?" And she's you know she's getting mad, and it's it's completely. I mean, he's just totally losing it in his desperation for control, like this. The first time in the movie, he doesn't get to be the center of his own world. I just think, yeah, he's not the center of attention right now. And the center of attention, but even, I mean, he's used to being the center of attention, but he's also used to having control over his space, whether he's alone or not, right? Yeah. And that just implodes in this scene. And you could just be cool, dude, and just ask, hey, can I get the next dance? Right. But he doesn't fucking do that. Instead, nope. he gets he gets physical with her. Yeah, he just grabs her. Right. And, you know, basically... And then is insulting to everyone else and says that Sarah can't dance, which is like this very – like says, oh, I'll, I'll dance with – you know, I'll dance with her. They start to – and he's like, oh, I forgot you can't dance, which she can actually. She can dance yeah. quite well. Like his wife can actually dance. So this is like this very cutting remark. And then they all end up – he suggests they all sleep out under the stars. So they all sleep in sleeping bags. Which, okay, this edit was when I did crack up because I was like – I was picturing like you know, out in the grass, do it a bonfire. And it's just, it's a hard cut to them, like on their deck, lined up in sleeping bags, waking up. Right. So should I just, I guess I'll just finish this off here. So yeah, we can yeah. sort of talk about that. So basically he gets up, he does another wild and crazy thing. It's the morning, wild and crazy thing in his underwear, jumps into the pool. Which is right next to where they were sleeping. But again, it's also like, hey, I'm the center of attention now. Hey, I bet nobody's going to follow me into the pool, guys. I'm the crazy guy. Right. I mean, the level of image. Yeah, it's, it's exactly that. And basically, the two guys jump in. Celia jumps in as well. Celia gets out. She's really cold. Uh, Sarah goes to get her clothes. Yeah. Victor, you know, Bill Gunn gets out of the water. She sort of lies. She's sort of lied. Celia's lied down again, and he starts assaulting her. Well, the way to get warm when you're out there and clothes aren't there is, hey, there's a sleeping bag right here. Let me warm up. Right. But like. He is like basically trying to get with her on the deck and she's pushing him off. And it is, I mean, it is basically we're watching an attempted rape. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's even, I don't, I don't think it's an attempted rape. I think he's just still being like, cause he just wants to, he's like, he's like, oh, let me have some of the bag or let me get in the bag too. She's like, no, get the fuck away from, you know, whatever. It, it didn't seem like to me, like it was a sexual assault coming your way. It was more just like, dude, read the room, back the fuck off. I, I don't think so. I think he's sexually assaulting her. I think that's actually what's going on there. I, it's a really, it's really awkward because he will not, he's playing around, but I mean, it is sexual assault. It may not be. Well, she's saying no. And he's saying, oh, come on. And then, you know, jumping and trying to get into a sleeping bag with her. So it is physical and she's saying no. Yeah. And it's very, yeah. And he won't stop. And like the other two guys are like off screen and like very purposely, they're not, you don't hear anything from them. That's a good point because it didn't yeah until you mentioned it just now i was like wait a minute where were there were two other guys i guess they were still in the pool i don't know if they got up and left i I don't remember the chronology there 
they don't like there's there's nothing with them and basically like yeah it's a very to me i i mean i think at the very least we're dealing with sexual assault he's really he's lost it he cannot handle his object right she's always been her own person in all of this she's not actually his object his his midlife crisis object he has not succeeded in like seducing her and just completely controlling her right and basically what stops him i mean that's part of what i mean is like this is no this could have evolved into something i mean it's something ugly and it could have evolved even uglier stops when sarah comes out with the clothes and basically blows up about about him basically you know you're you're you know your cock is not a brush basically <laughs> i tried right, right, yeah hurting. but basically you know bringing to a head his philandering the fact that she's not a able to do these things quote unquote right and definitely hinting that this isn't the first time she's aware that this has probably happened happened yeah the striking thing about this to me is one he i think he, yes he is assaulting this person right and when she comes out she doesn't mention it at all she's clearly coming out to stop him and she throws the clothes down too like she did still bring some clothes out for celia yeah she brought clothes out for celia but there's basically she doesn't mention any of that, that this is actually like the type of inappropriateness that this is. She doesn't say anything to Celia. There's no interaction. Celia just, you know, looks at once Sarah leaves, looks at him and just leaves. You know, it's like we're done here. Yeah. And that struck me. And I think it's intentional because we haven't really talked about the class politics is like Celia is not from the same class as them. Right. And so part of the toy like element of I, I think there's sort of an exoticism to somebody who's Puerto Rican, I guess. But also is is to a certain degree i think there's a class politics to how he views her uh cilia that is right. and maybe sarah does too but she certainly doesn't she's focused on her own relationship as opposed to what her husband has actually done right, exactly now she also hasn't blamed cilia at any point either which is nice yeah that's a, i think an interesting dynamic to sort of like their I, I think to the class politics of this couple and how that sort of combines in in complicated ways with the race politics and the sort of their position in, in society where, you know, they're always aware of this sort of liminality of their existence of like, or uh, of this sort of like, that they're both in this sort of class position and this cultural and these sort of as cultural producers and whatever, but also that black people aren't really supposed to be in that position. Well, it's also kind of even just geographically too, they're on vacation where Cecilia lives. Yes. They're, yeah. I mean, they're in a sense like intruders into this neighborhood. She's having sort of adventure, hang out with these bohemians or whatever. Right. But like, so the last scene of the movie is Victor rushing to get to the movie set, which is back in town, which is just, you know, the campus. And you're doing the final scene where Sarah's character shoots Duke's character for philandering. There may be some symbolism here. <laughs> A uh, little bit, yes. Yeah. So this is like the wrap up of the 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 uh, avant garde student films retelling of Frankie and Johnny, which is this is where you get this double narrative now too, where yeah, it comes to complete fruition and it completely collides. I think brilliantly in this like very final scene, where you get an alternative ending for Sarah, which she has found like freedom and passion through artistic expression and this performance she has. I don't know how that's going to play out. Like the, this is the final scene. So like, it's like kind of a, ah, like there, there's a release to it. I felt watching it where like, she can't, she's not, well, I mean, she's like telling him off to a degree in the previous scene in real life, but in the, but in, then in this artistic version of it, this artistic, artistic expression of it, she just, she shoots him dead for, for having an affair. I don't need the next scene in their real life to see what the fallout is from that. Right. Because it's just such a beautiful, like, it's just a beautiful artistic way to end the movie with um, the movie within the movie is actually giving you the ending. With the look of horror on his face as she. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And then go back to Victor. She's like, what? As, the, as, yeah. she sh as she shoots Duke, but Duke is him. Right. <laughs> and also clearly the guy she does not want to shoot. Yep. I mean, the in guy, real life, but not in the movie. But I, yeah, in the, the movie. She's perfectly happy to have a fling with because, you know. Yeah. He seems a lot nicer. Uh, among other things. Yeah. That's an ending, man. Hell yeah. It's, I mean, that's just it. Think about all the, Hey, 
think about all the different tones this movie can, contains. You know, honestly, because I didn't think about it uh, before. I mean, I watched it. I didn't really think about it at the time because it just, it like you said, it just it was such like a, an organic narrative and it flowed and all of it. I was like, yeah, that's this is exactly how you would tell this story. Until, like I mentioned at the top of the show, looking at the different descriptions on Letterboxd and IMDb, and they're all saying comedy drama. I was like, wait, I, I mean, I laughed out loud a couple times, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put the comedy first. I mean, I think it's it's a drama, and then there's some elements of comedy, but. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's a really, really striking tone throughout the whole movie. Or it's a really striking balance of tones throughout the whole movie. Yeah, it's it's really, I mean, it's just it's just such an impressive display of filmmaking. You know, part of what, what's hard about this, of course, is like we don't really get to see what is like, a, you know, a really brilliant filmmaker do this again, partially because of the structural issues that we mentioned, but partially because both, well, Kathleen Collins, Bill Gunn, and Dwayne Jones all die in the late 80s, what, within a year of each other? Yeah, 80, 88 and 89. Uh, Kathleen Collins um, was the youngest. She was 46, uh, died of breast cancer. Um, Bill Gunn, 54, and Dwayne Jones, 51. But yeah, all within, um, I didn't like line up the dates, but it's like 88 and 89. You're like, oh, good God. I mean, you know, part of it is, is that, you know, the the 90s is a period in which you see a lot more black film. Well, even just like in the, which well, I mean, we we're going to mention in a moment here, we talk about the next movie we're up to, but like, when you get like Spike Lee hit the scene, like late, late eighties, like right. who knows what kind of amazing Renaissance of these, these three artists that were, you know, lost us in 88, 89. What would they have been doing? Had you been in the 90s? Like Lee was a fan of all of them and would have been, you know, champ- I mean, we you still have luckily Charles Burnett around and we talked about last episode, but like, oh my God, this collaboration on, on losing ground. I want to see what kind of a rela- film relationship would have been built and been explored in the nineties as they, you know, head into their, you know, like later careers. It, I mean, frankly, I mean, sometimes the prime of your, the prime of your directing careers. Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, for one thing, I mean, in terms of, you know, all of these, I mean, you know, Kathleen Collins is, is, is sort of resurrected in a sense later, at least when the movie comes out, like 2015. Gonch and Hess really gets rediscovered in the late nineties. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess Dwayne Jones, I mean, I had a, a very different career, right? I mean, he's he's not a director. He also, you well, know, film, film wise, right? Yeah. He, well, oh, yeah. well, I'm sorry. That's the thing is he's 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 a he's a stage director and a successful one, and and did you know lots of other things? Yeah, an academic um, uh, literature departments and colleges, and yeah, absolutely, and an administrator. So, like, part of his when he does movies, I mean, he, he I, I was looking at his you know his, his stuff, and there's some 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 pretty lame looking horror movies, but when you sort of think about like his batting average for the number of movies that he's in. Yeah. There's like at least three masterpieces. in there. Well, like, look at the first three. It's Night of Living Dead, Ganja and Hess and Losing Ground. Yes. And I haven't seen Beat Street in 84, but, you know, early breakdancing DJ kind of graffiti culture. Um, Could be. It may not be good. It kind of sounds like a canon film, but I, I'm planning on watching it. Um, but also like, you know, I, I think he was able to not to get into like the, the economics of, you know, Dwayne Jones life, but like, He's a professional in so far as he's working in um in in theater and he was at Antioch College doing the overseeing the literature department. Like he has a living he's making with his academic and theater pursuits. Maybe he just dug horror movies and being the guy from Night of the Living Dead, he could be in like Vampires and Fright House and To Die For, not the Gus Van Sant movie To Die For, but uh, another vampire movie. So maybe he just dug vampires and you know liked liked the horror genre. I don't know. I mean, part of this is this is one of these things where I feel like we're going to be doing like this is a movie that caused us to want to do a lot of research to figure out more about these different about these different people who seem to be sort of intertwined at some level. Yeah, because, you know, at least Bill Gunn and Dwayne Jones, right, because they work together in in Ganja Ness. So like which was like almost 10 years prior to losing ground. So I'm guessing that that was uh, that was an amicable relationship for both of them if they got back together, uh, at least for, for film here. Yeah. We're both in the in the world of theater, um, so like I, I sort of want to like sort of look through, you know like do a little more digging to sort of answer a- answer these sort of questions because they weren't the ones that we started choosing this movie with. But it, it ended up producing uh, an itch we need to scratch. So exactly, I don't, I'm not sure I like that metaphor, but <laughs> um, I pulled up a couple of quotes uh, I thought might be an interesting way to wrap up um, talking about losing ground here. Um, I grabbed one from well, besides like the clip we played earlier from Kathleen Collins. There's also one from uh, Ronald 
um, Ronald Gray, who was the um, uh, cinematographer and co-editor uh, with Kathleen Collins on Losing Ground, he had said, because I think somebody had asked him about, um, you know, it was, a, it was an audience for this movie. Obviously, like it didn't get a big theatrical release. It finally got discovered later on. Um, actually, I'm not sure how, if he was still around then. But the quote I found from him, I thought was pretty, pretty, um, pretty insightful. He said, the audience, at least some, didn't respond positively because there was no ghetto in the film. There was no, quote, poor, suffering black folk uh, for an audience to identify with. Yep. Which is true and speaks to exactly what Kathleen Collins was talking about in that earlier clip we we had uh, where, you know, like you know, people don't want to see just like, you know, an ordinary life because these are generally the outsiders, the the sinners and whatnot. Right. Well, and part of it is they don't they don't want to see even when that quote environment is on film, they don't want to see it when someone like Charles Burnett is doing it because he's not going to give them what they want. He's not going to exoticize it for them. Right, right. He's not going to he's not going to give them. The white liberal perspective when you're making the movie, or it's, or exploitation, movie. or or exploitation perspective, which is right, much exactly, yeah. Movie. Which you know that you know the white liberal case is a little bit, kind of an exploitation of its own, right? So like these these two different lenses of exploitation, these are these are all creators who are not going to do that and are right. not going to be in those boxes. Why can't you just make a green book type movie? Come on! Oh my god! Oh uh, my god! Open that can of worms. <laughs> Scour it from the record. Oh. oh yeah, oh Mahershala. I wish. Uh, well, anyway. All right, that's um, a whole other. Yeah, maybe that'll be a series we do of like movies with really shitty politics uh, for for a theme. Uh, some future series of shows somewhere. So, th- I on the face of it, I really like that idea, but I, I should just say like when we did our summer series last summer when we were doing blockbusters, mm-hmm. it's just like once you're like through like two months of it, you're just like oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> no, that may just maybe we'll just have to sprinkle them in on occasion. I don't yeah, I don't think that would be a, a good I don't think that would be a mentally healthy long term project for us, but right. Yeah. Yeah, no, like, that's the next series we're gonna go through all of Dinesh D'Souza's documentaries, Isaac. Oh, oh my god. Never. I mean I've watched them, but no, that's yeah, no. <laughs> uh so that the other one I mentioned I, I that, so that was from cinematographer and co editor Ronald Gray as a quote. Uh, wrapping things up with a quote from uh, the woman herself, Kathleen Collins, talking. Oh, actually, I think it was from that. Um, I think it was from that masterclass video I mentioned earlier. It was a quote from there. Nobody. Oh, sorry. Quote. Nobody would give any money to a black woman to direct a film. It was probably the most discouraging time of my life. <sighs> yeah, I didn't realize what a downer that actually was to end on. Anyway, the the, the caveat to that is. She went out and made losing ground completely on her own and knocked out of the park. Right. She made a, a superb movie, which we are watching today and others are as well and is easily, easily accessible for all time. I mean, not all time, but you know what I mean? On, on criterion channel right now. So everybody can watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of going and watching Isaac, what have we got up next? So uh, next week we're going to sort of continue on, on the theme that we're on right now. Uh, or on the tr- a little bit of the track, let's say these are all different movies with different approaches, but they're all micro budget, micro budgeted movies um, by black uh, auteur directors. So we're going to look at uh, Watermelon Woman from 1996 by Cheryl uh, Dunier, which is a movie I, I I've, I've watched before. I think I mentioned it on the show last year, mm-hmm. um, but uh, you haven't watched it, and we did not do we did not do a full episode on it, and it's really really good and deserves one. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'd read a lot about it because it was a time period when I I started film school in 95. So like, I remember it being out in theaters. I also remember thinking, I don't have the money <laughs> to just go to go to the uh, downtown art house and, and watch movies. But this is also fascinating because it, it checks off so many boxes of what was going on with independent American film in the early to mid 90s. Which is also, like you said, it's very auteur. Again, uh, writer, director, I believe she produced it. She stars in it and she edited the movie herself and fairly self-financed. It, but it's also part of this, uh, I think, really landmark series of films or era of films called New Queer Cinema that popped up in American films um, in the the mid to, uh, like I said, early to mid 1990s. So we're going to, I don't think we've really taken too close a look at much of the the independent or even any of the new queer stuff actually before on the show. So. I'm looking forward to uh, to diving in here. And on top of which, 
there's a ton of film history in this movie. Yes. So this is this is gonna be fun. It is gonna be fun. And I think from what I've read, it's actually like a very much overt comedy. Or am I set myself up for, for disappointment the way I did with Don't Look Up? Uh I I mean I think uh Don't Look Up is more a overt comedy. It's not a ha ha comedy. Yes, yes, but it's a lot of things. Okay. I've always heard it as like a romantic comedy. Mm, oh, we'll yeah. see. Let's just, let's just watch it. Uh, All right. Let's, let's just, just watch, watch it. it yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. But uh, as usual, before we sign off, we always like to remind you to please rate and review the show in whatever podcast app you are using. And if you enjoy the show or a particular episode, tell a friend or two about it. We're up and running on the usual socials and whatnot. All the links are in the show notes. So give us a follow uh, there. And until next time, I'm Aaron. And I am Isaac. And, um, you know, stay safe out there. I realize that, like, lightning doesn't strike very often, per se. Like, it's really, like, not really that much of a danger. But that's why people don't look out for it. So what if what if lightning hit a tree near you and it fell on you today? That would really suck. So keep, keep an eye out. Keep your eyes up. Keep your eyes up.